Good morning. The courageous ones are here. <laughs> Gideon's army. So um, this morning, we're going to do two things. I'm going to uh, give a presentation on coming home to the Father. Um, and then we're going to have some time for you to give testimonies. And I hope that uh, you'll want to give glory to God for what he did for you or what you received. Um, my first book uh, that I was pushed to write was called The Older Brother Returns. And it was just about how I had discovered after 15 years of believing I was the prodigal son come home, I had discovered that I was also the older, older brother and how I ne needed not just to deal with the external sins, but the internal sins, the sins of the heart. And that kind of laid the foundation for, for Unbound uh, to come forth uh, like 10 or 12 years later. Uh, it's just being able to understand my own heart and others. And then Unbound uh, exploded, and I've written a couple of children's books that flowed out of that. I've written uh, Resisting the Devil, a Catholic perspective on deliverance, because because Unbound was a practical guide, and I wrote the, uh, along with my son, the guidebook, uh, which is really for leaders and just developing those for those who are learning to minister to others. And, and all along the way, ever since I wrote Unbound, there was another book in my heart, and that book was about the Father. Uh, as you know, the fifth key is about the Father's blessing. But there was something in me that just said it's not enough. It didn't express enough of what was in me, and I just felt this incredible need to, uh, to write about the Father. And uh, I didn't really, I don't have another book in mind. I don't plan on writing another book, so it's kind of the book ends as the older brother returns and Abba's heart. And uh, now God might shift and give me something to write, but I... Uh, but to me, this is the finishing word. So I'm going to speak today about Abba's heart uh, under the title of Come Home, Coming Home to the Father. And I believe that many of you have been doing that all week. Actually, I believe you've been doing that all your life. <laughs> but it's a message that is, is critically needed, I believe, in the church today. As someone surrenders to Jesus and confesses him as Lord, embraces their faith, uh, the dynamic work of the Holy Spirit is released. We prayed last night about the cry of the Spirit being released in our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Well, that, that cry is released, and a lot of people don't know how to fully release it. Uh, I believe that that work that the Holy Spirit's doing to release that cry and bring us to the Father is, the, is a way of understanding all the sanctifying work that he does in us to make us holy and to continue to bring us into the fullness of what it means to be children of God. And he does that by revealing the Father to us and drawing us into the Father's heart. So no matter how much you have received or how much I have received, over the years, a revelation of the Father, I know there's always more. Every disciple goes through a season. And, um, and some of the seasons we've been through, you've been through, I've been through, is where the Holy Spirit is emphasizing Jesus or em emphasizing a relationship with the church or with his mother or the emphasis shifts. And then there's seasons when he's going to emphasize what it means to be in relationship with the Father. So I want to, I want to look at some of my conversion and ongoing conversion in terms of coming home to the Father. We all have a longing for home. I remember the first time I came home from college. Uh, I had not been away from home for four months ever in my life. 
And when I came home, nobody was in the house, and I, I just kind of walked around. And I just looked at, I remember looking at an ashtray. <laughs> and it just brought memories to me. And I looked at a picture on the wall and, and, the, and the living room couch. And I was just taking it all in. What all these things represented to me and spoke to me of is they just spoke to me of, of home. It's, it's those familiar things that just kind of said, this is home, this is the place where I belong. And that's what home is. It, it, it's the place where you belong. It's the place where we're known. It's the place where we know others. It's the place where we're able to be ourselves. And that's the place we find rest. Now, none of us grew up in a perfect home. And many of you grew up in uh, a home that was not happy or it wasn't even safe. But we're still longing for a place called home. This is how we were made. God placed us in families so that we could come to know our true identity as children of the eternal Father in whose heart is our true home. God placed us in families so we could know the Father. In Ephesians chapter 3, 15, the Apostle Paul tells us that every family in heaven and on earth derives its name from the Father. The very nature and meaning of the family has its source in God the Father. It was intended that the Father would reveal, be revealed to us in families. But because of sin, families have become a place for us, for many of us, where the goodness of the Father has been hidden from us. So what was, what was meant to reveal the Father has become, because of sin, a place where the Father is obscured and hidden. St. John Paul II said, original sin attempts to abolish fatherhood, destroying its rays which permeate the created world, placing in doubt the truth about God who is love, and leaving man only with a sense of master-slave relationship. The power of sin working in our midst continues to obscure the Father and to obscure our true identity as his children. Sin leaves us acting like orphans and slaves. Many of you, uh, many of you might have, that received ministry yesterday might have renounced an orphan spirit. I know a lot of times when I I talk to people, they grew up in families of 10, 12. Did you ever feel like an orphan? Oh, yeah, I did. Didn't make any sense to me. I remember one, uh, one girl said, oh, my brothers and sisters used to tell me I was adopted. And, <laughs> and one time I went to my, my, my mom about it, and she said, I had eight other kids. You think I would adopt you? <laughs> <laughs> But it was like these, these seeds of insecurity and then words are spoken and it's like, it's just like, it's another way of saying, I don't know why, but I just don't belong. I just don't feel like I belong. Everybody else seems to belong. I don't belong. Or everybody else seems to connect with dad, but I don't. Spirit of fatherlessness. So the enemy is always trying to rob us of our relationship and the potential for intimacy with God the Father. So even though many people who, uh, we have encountered many people that have encountered Jesus and had a great, powerful encounter with the Holy Spirit like we did last night, and yet the Father remains distant and hidden. And sometimes there's a fear of the Father He's the judge of the Old Testament. He's waiting to catch me in my sin. 
uh, and to punish me for any little thing and, and maybe close the door of heaven to me. I had one nationally known Catholic leader say to me, I'm okay with Jesus, but the Father, he scares me. We may look to Jesus and, and press into him for, for mercy and love and forgiveness, but like, like we just keep pushing the Father back or, or we've never allowed the Father himself to come close to us. Now, on the other hand, there's others that perceive the Father in the way that they want him to be. This twisted idea of the Father that is based on um, maybe how their father was or some imaginary uh, person uh, where the father is just, he's my daddy and he will do whatever I want him to do. And if he doesn't do what I want him to do, I'll be mad at him and I'll give him a piece of my mind. And so there's this faith is the grace-filled response to revelation. What is the revelation of the Father that we're responding to? Or is it not revelation, just imagination? It's a deep longing in all of us to know the Father. In fact, the very Spirit of God is, is, is working in us now, crying out for us to know the Father. But sometimes, sometimes he remains distant to some of us, and sometimes, sometimes uh, just saying the word Father gets stuck in our throats. Or we say Father, but it has no significance, no meaning. Oh, we say, you know, we, we pray in the liturgy to, <laughs> to the Father, and we pray the Our Father, and yet there's no personal connection for it. Now, I'm speaking to some of you, I'm, uh, in one way, I'm speaking to you as those that are proclaiming this message and, and the people in the pews need to hear this message. But I'm also speaking to you as like, in relationship to the Father, there's always more. Because that's the work of Jesus within us to bring us to the Father. A question we can ask ourselves, or I would like to ask you, is can we find freedom apart from a relationship with the Father? Can we find freedom apart from a relationship with the Father? Now, I know that God's grace works wonders in your heart, no matter what the obstacle. And he can, in a real way, bring incredible freedom. <clears throat> But there's another answer to that question, which is, no, <laughs> we can't. Because of who we really are. So let me, let me just, uh, in John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus said to those that believed in him, this is to those who believed in him, if you continue in my word, you will truly be my disciples and you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. All truth sets us free. But there is a hierarchy of truth. And the greatest truth that reveals man to himself is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In this... If this verse is quoted out of context, we miss the deep, deeper meaning of what Jesus is, is saying, the deeper point that he's trying to make. Because in verse 27, before he spoke this, these words, he said, it says, they did not understand that he spoke to them about the Father. He was speaking about the Father, and then he says, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They could not see. They did not understand. We are his children. That's who we are. 
It's the freedom of the sons and daughters of God. In 1 John 3, 1, it says, See the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. He is a good Father who loves to care for his children. In Matthew 7, 9 to 11, it says, If you, then, though you are evil, know how to good give, give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? He is a good father. But many have been deceived. Actually, all of us have been deceived. In the garden, we, have, we had intimacy with the Father, and we walked with him in the cool of the day. And just remember, remember you were in Adam. You, we walked with him in the cool of the day, and he entrusted everything to us, and we trusted him. And then the tempter came along, with the fundamental lie that still grips us today. The fundamental lie is God is not a good father and he can't be trusted. We swallowed that lie through sin and it made a home in our fallen nature and we have been bound by a twisted perception of God ever since. Jesus came to break the power of that lie, to set it straight, to reveal the Father, and to be himself the pathway, the way, home to the Father's heart. We're told in, one, in John 1, 18, no one has ever seen God. The only Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. Another translation says, referring to the Son, who is in closest relationship with the Father. So Jesus, who is in the bosom of the Father, he is the one that is making the Father known. And we can grow up calling God Father <laughs> and thinking of him in terms of Father, but if you want to know him, there's only one way to know him, and that's to know him through the Son, who comes from the bosom of the Father, is in closest relationship with the Father, who is the very Son of the Father who makes him known. And the good news is that he's going to continue to make him known. John 17, 25 and 26. Righteous Father, Jesus says, Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these that you have sent me, I have made you known to them, and I will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. That I myself might be in them, and I will continue to make you known. The spiritual life, this... I mean, you have much more wisdom about the spiritual life than I do, but I just understand it from this perspective in a simple way. Jesus is making the Father known and he's revealing my heart and exposing my heart so I can receive the love of the Father through the Son. This is his commitment to you. As you go forth from here and... and uh, some of you have to stand on what you renounced. Say, yeah, I'm not going to let that in again. I'm making my stand. I'm going to stand on it. But every one of us needs to have that confidence. The Father is going to continue. Uh, Jesus is going to continue to make the Father known to me. And what it means to be free. And what it means to be a son. Pope Benedict XVI wrote this. Jesus' communion with the Father is the true center of his personality. Without it, we cannot understand him at all. And it is from this center that he makes himself present to us today. If we're holding back from the Father, I can't relate to the Father. My Father was this. I, it just, I can't make that leap. God's not demanding you to make a leap you can't make, but if you just cut it off and say, Jesus, 
Mary, Holy Spirit, that's enough for me. <clears throat> We're cutting ourselves off from Jesus. You want to be a disciple of Jesus? You want to live like Jesus? You need to live in relationship to the Father. He only did what the Father, he saw the Father doing, he only said what the Father was saying, and, and it's in this dynamic that we have been invited to enter in. And it's the only way to really understand Jesus, but enter into this relationship with the Father. Pope Benedict says we can't understand him at all. Because it's at, from this center that he makes himself known to us and still today. Jesus said, if a man loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. The Father and the Son have made their home in us and invites us to make our home in him. <clears throat> so the question is, how is it that the Father can be, remain hidden especially from those of us who have embraced our baptism, have received him. Well, I'm going to give you two, two reasons. One reason is how the Father has been misrepresented to us. We carry father wounds and mother wounds, and we need to be set free from those bondages because they twist our idea, our understanding of our loving Heavenly Father. The need to know the Father is universal. As a matter of fact, the, my passion to write Abba's Heart, whom, which I wrote with my son Matt, which is glorious that a father and son would write a book together. And, uh, but my passion is because we were teaching about the Father's blessing in countries throughout the world. And in many places, it was the Father's blessing that was everything. They never heard anything about it. They never heard anything like it. They never had any idea of the true love and compassion of the Father. It's true in this country, but it's universal because the Spirit of God is within us working to draw us into intimacy with the Father. And there's going to be times in your life, maybe it's now, maybe it's next, maybe it's next month, but there's going to be times in your life you're going to, you realize there's an absence and the Father's drawing near and he wants you to draw near to him. The second reason is knowing the Father through the Son is a lifelong process. John's gospel is a special gift. Perhaps 30 years after the synoptic gospels were spread widely, there was another gospel that needed to be written. One that came out of the experience of the youngest disciple living life longer than all the others. As John grew spiritually and in his understanding and his reflection, he had Mary, the mother of Jesus, under his care to guide him. They together had time to reflect, to remember, to share together about the intimacy Jesus had with the Father and how he was inviting them into the relationship. So when you read the Gospel of John, think about John's heart just inviting you in to this relationship with the Father. A real moment was when Thomas and Philip asked Jesus to show them the way to the Father. So I kind of picture it this way. Jesus is, is, is saying, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead of you, and you know the way that I'm going. And I imagine the disciples speaking to each other, and he says, saying, there he goes again. <laughs> He's ta he, he keeps talking about the Father. Do you see the Father? Do you see? 
I don't see him. Jesus sees him. I, I don't know what he's talking about. Now he's going, he's going to go away and he's going to prepare a place for us in the Father's house and there's going to be many rooms there. I don't know what he's talking about. So Thomas, who represents one, part of our personality, says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Show us the way. Give me directions. Tell me what to do. Jesus says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you'd known me, you would have known my Father also. Henceforth, you would know, you know him and have seen him. Imagine Thomas with that answer. I just asked. He's going someplace. I just want directions. So then you have Philip from another part of our personality and from who we are, he, he cries out for all of us. And he says, he said, Lord, show us the Father and then we'll be satisfied. John gave us that prayer. It's yours. Lord, Show us the Father, and then we'll be satisfied. May, the, may God give us a hunger. May he even frustrate us like Thomas and Philip so that we cry out from a deeper place in our heart to receive what God wants to give us. So now I'm going to share a little bit about my personal journey of how that frustration came in and his response. Two years after I encountered the Lord, I, I, I was baptized in the Spirit in 1970, and two years later I was in this dry place wondering where, where Jesus was, and he seemed far away, and uh, I was laboring, and I was facing discouragement. And... Um, And I went through uh, an inner healing and I experienced forgiveness of, of my father and, and a restoration in the family. And so that was really the beginning and opening in, in my heart. And, uh, <clears throat> and then I was staying uh, with some people and, uh, and this, this man was over at the house and he was talking about God, and they were into theology, and he was talking about God, and he just kept saying, he just kept referring to God as Father. Over and over again, he said, Father this, Father that, Father this. And I'm there thinking, I don't know if he knows Jesus. <laughs> I mean, the, the Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus, I think he's just talking about the Father, and I don't think he knows this Jesus. And then this thought crossed my mind. The Father is second best. And as soon as that thought came through my mind, I realized, ooh, something is wrong here. I knew that wasn't true, but that was what was coming out of my heart. It was a protest because I didn't know the Father. He was talking about something I didn't know it exposed my heart. And that's when I went off and, and, and received ministry, and, and, uh, and that's when I, I uh, was led to, uh, through an inner healing model, I was basically led to forgive my father. And the forgiveness wasn't so much based on bad memories, because that was, that was all blocked out. I just didn't have them. I loved, honored my father. But it was what wasn't given, what wasn't there, the absence to not being there needed to be resolved, but it needed to be exposed before it could be dealt with. <clears throat> My father had uh, long since passed away, but the Lord began to just restore my love and my sense of belonging through that time of forgiveness. 
But there's a number of other points I'd like to share with you on my journey back to the Father. I remember one Good Friday, my eyes being opened. I was meditating on the crucifixion of Jesus, and we were at the reading about his suffering, and he was pierced for our transgressions, and I could clearly see behind the crucified Christ, I could clearly see the Father's broken heart. And now when I, and since that time, I, I see the Father all the time behind the Son or through the Son. Another significant thing that happened was <clears throat> uh, my firstborn son. I, I had, my, my son was born, my firstborn. And when I became a father, I realized that I didn't know how to be a father. But I, I figured it this way. I said, if I could only learn to be a son, then I would know how to be a father. And so I pressed in to wanting to, to live as a son of the eternal father. And it's, I think it's the same for you. How am I to be a father to my parishioners? Be a son. Press in to your sonship. Press in the relationship with the Father. And then your spiritual children will experience his fatherly love come through you. Because we're all inadequate. We can only give what we received. 1986, I was delivered of a spirit of rejection. That opened up whole new levels of trust and confidence. <clears throat> Many years after that, I went on this personal silent retreat. I just borrowed somebody's sure house and went down there to be by myself, to be with the Lord. <clears throat> it was my, my pain and my desolation that led me there wasn't getting any better. I just felt really alone. I wanted to go home. I was talking to God, but he was silent. Then. I went for a walk on the beach and I began to talk to God again, but this time it went deeper. I was alone on the beach. It was late fall. And I expressed my deepest needs to God and I, I basically said this, God, I don't understand why it is so hard. And I said this out loud. Why am I so empty? Where are you? And then as I, I began to speak, the concerns and the words changed. And I spoke from the memories of my dad. My father died uh, more than 20 years earlier. And it's actually his death led to my conversion. But now on the beach, I, I found myself saying, I don't understand, dad, why you weren't there for me as a boy. And I don't, I don't know why I didn't know you. And as I spoke these kinds of things, tears came to my eyes. Tears that I didn't shed at the funeral or after. Emotions that I was unaware of were coming up. And I began to grieve the loss of my father at a, at a new level because I faced it in relationship to my own heart. You know, when a, a parent dies, it's like whatever you were missing, it seems like it's final. As long as they're alive, you think, well, maybe I can get it. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll get that thing that I've always wanted, even if I don't know what that thing is, and then they die, and it's like, it's done. And we need to grieve, we need to grieve the loss of what wasn't said, wasn't spoken, wasn't happened. So I was grieving his loss. <clears throat> and as I expressed my pain, I began to say, Dad, would you forgive me for all the years of rebellion? And I, I, I repented for withdrawing my heart and 
for my selfishness, making it so hard for him to love me or to reach me. And then I spoke forgiveness, and I found peace. And then I sensed the Heavenly Father's presence. And in my mind, as you know, I get pictures a lot. <laughs> so in my mind, I had this, this image of my father, <clears throat> who he loved the ocean. I just had a picture of him walking out into the sea. He wasn't, he was like wa almost walking on the water, but just like floating kind of just out there. And as he, as he left, he was waving. And then he went like this. And I knew what he was saying. I knew what it meant. It meant we've come to the completion of this chapter. And you're going to do it. I'm proud of you. I'm with you. And I, I'd leave you with the Lord or different impressions that came to me. So years later, as I understood and began to understand the Father's blessing, and we pray, and the fifth key is the Father's blessing, I was receiving the Father's blessing through the memory of my Father, saying and communicating that which, which had been lacking. God has encounters for all of us. Because the Heavenly Father wants to break in and he wants to fill the empty place wherever you did not receive the words of affirmation. Your father didn't bless you, didn't say words, maybe didn't bless your priesthood, maybe held back in your choice. Maybe there's a whole host of things that sometimes we carry that we just need to bring to the Lord. We need to forgive, renounce the lies and say, Father, I need to hear from you. I need your blessing, I need your words, I need to hear your whispers, and I'm gonna trust in your whispers, and I'm gonna trust that, that I can hear your voice and receive it. And maybe you'll get a brother or a sister to pray, pray with you and speak the Father's blessing over you, and, and those words can penetrate your heart and change everything because you know the lack that you've been living under was just a lie, it was just a deception of the enemy. It was just a small story, not the bigger eternal story of which Jesus has, has broken out of it into your story to bring you home to the Father. So now for me, and I think I might have mentioned this, but the three titles for Jesus that are most significant for me as he was introduced as Savior and Lord and Son. For me, the Son always meant, when I ever read the Son of God, I said, oh, he's God. That means Jesus is God. That's true. But for now, for now, the Son means, the Son has made his home in me. He dwells in me. And I have an ongoing relationship with the Father as I identify with the Son. So I'm just going to take a few minutes now to reflect on the heart of the Father. And the place to start, I'm just going to talk about the prodigal of the two sons and then his final words to us. Jesus tells us of a father who lost his two sons. One is in open rebellion, and the other is withdrawing his heart. One ran off, rejected him, basically saying, you are dead to me. The other focused on fulfilling his outward duty. He was doing what he was supposed to do, but he abandoned his father through resentment, judgment, and bitterness. Jesus reveals in this parable the broken heart of God the Father, pleading for his children to return. He runs out to the prodigal. When the prodigal turns to him, he goes to his, the older brother whose heart is hard, and he pleads him to enter in to the celebration. I cannot imagine the pain of losing a child 
I have four sons and 14 grandchildren. And from time to time, I minister to people who's, who's lost a child to death, suicide, drugs. You read in the paper about children that are kidnapped, disappeared, stolen, just stolen, never to come home. Perhaps you've experienced it in your life, in your family life, or perhaps you've experienced it through people that are close to you in your parish, and you, you've seen this incredible agony. Sometimes children's minds are twisted through drugs or mental illness, and the memory of their love has been robbed of your love for them, a parent's love for them. And, and the parent becomes the object of their wrath and their hatred, and they blame their parent for all the, the suffering, and, and you've been unjustly blamed for every problem in people's lives. But the more you can perceive that, the more you can understand the Father. See, the eternal Father lost his children in the garden. They were stolen, kidnapped, and he will do anything to get them back. They were sentenced to death, and he will take their death sentence on himself through his son. He will suffer their pain, pay the greatest ransom ever paid for their release. When they come home, he will heal their hearts and restore their memory of his goodness. He will give them hearts of flesh and he will put a new spirit in them that cries out to him for intimacy and affection. Abba, Father. This is the Father's heart towards us. Yet, we saw it differently. This is the Father standing in the garden as we were sent away to live out the, the, the consequences of our choice. But when humanity left the garden of his delight, they lost sight of his goodness. The human perception of God was twisted, not based on revelation, but based on our inability to understand his love and the evil that has befallen us. So how do we interpret that? Where is God? We carry this fear that, that God has abandoned us. We're alone. God has left us. He doesn't care. Even if we know the Lord, we're tempted to blame God for the evil that comes into the world against us every day. We're tempted to blame him or to be angry with him or judge him or shake our fist at him. We do not understand how good, how good God could allow such suffering and I know every one of you have answered that question with a good theological answer. <laughs> but somehow, it doesn't always reach our own hearts, much less someone else's. We just don't understand him from here. We're all participating in this spiritual battle to believe, to trust. Psalm 13 captured this, captures this for us. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemies triumph over me? And then the psalm ends with, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praises for he has been good to me. Both sides struggle within us. How long, O oh Lord? But I trust in your love. It's the spiritual battle. Jesus revealed the depth and the pain of the human heart when he identified with our sins 
and our separation from God, and he cried out on our behalf. He cried out for all humanity when he said, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? That's the human condition apart from salvation. That's the only thing that's at the core of our fear. And Jesus took it, when he took our sins, he understood our basic deception and how twisted our understanding of God is. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Yet we're the ones that abandoned him. Jesus knows our fear, and the issue is settled. Jesus surrendered to death, and the Father's faithfulness is demonstrated forever for us in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It's settled. In the movie, The Passion of the Christ, there's a teardrop that falls from heaven at the moment of uh, the moment Jesus died. This is an image of the Father's love for the Son. It's also an image of the broken heart of the Father. <clears throat> when I saw that movie and I saw that teardrop, this question came to my mind. When did the teardrop fall? Did it fall when Jesus died? Or did it fall when Adam sinned? In eternity, these two moments cannot be separated. The moment Adam sinned was the same moment in eternity Jesus died. We cannot separate the Father's pain for the suffering of his crucified son and the pain over the loss of his children. They are eternally joined together. We know in Colossians 1.15 that the Son is the image of the invisible God. And in Hebrews 1.13, it says the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Jesus crucified is the image of the Father's broken heart. when people come to you and confess their sins, God's broken heart is present to be communicated. Jesus did not come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. He was sent by the Father whose heart was broken over the loss of his children. But the broken heart of God is only half the picture At the same moment that his heart was broken, his heart was also full of joy. His heart is not like ours. Joy is not constrained by suffering. In Luke 15, the parable of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son, all followed by descriptions of heaven's joy, celebration. It says there was rejoicing in the presence of of angels, of the angels of God, over one sinner who repents. The Father was rejoicing in the presence of the angels. <clears throat> Joy was spread throughout heaven when one sinner returns. Jesus is revealing the Father's joy, and all heaven participates in it. And this is the reason why Jesus endured the cross. Hebrews 12, 2. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy set before him. Jesus came to reveal the Father. And in a certain way, you can think of it this way. He came to heal the Father's heart. I picture Jesus saying, Dad, I'm coming home, and look, whom I'm, look who I'm bringing with me. 
We're going to celebrate. So the next time you mess up or you're tempted to think of him as angry and judging you, rejecting you, condemning you, withdrawing his love from you and, or his fatherly care, think of the father of Luke 15, standing, waiting, longing, pleading for his son's return and the joy that awaits him, awaits you. God hates sin because it separates you from the knowledge of his goodness. God's wrath is directed at sin, not you. We come under the wrath when we identify and don't separate from the sin. But God's wrath isn't directed at you, it's at, at your sin. <clears throat> at the moment you turn home to God, you're leaving your sin, and he wants to embrace you and kiss you and restore you. So let me just read this to you. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven, against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the cat fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Heaven's joy came down from heaven in their celebration. The first message of the risen Lord to you after the resurrection was entrusted to Mary Magdalene. We have this incredible picture of a woman's passion and God's heart. Mary is at the tomb. She's weeping. She's uncontrollable in her grief, and, and she wants to find the Lord. She wants to be near him. She wants to touch him. She wants to care for him. And, and, uh, and Jesus, the picture in John's gospel is... So incredible. Jesus is on the way to the Father. He had not yet re returned to the Father. And he's, he's like, this is what he's all about. He's going to the Father. And, and he hears her heart. And he comes back. Weeping so hard she doesn't recognize him until he calls her name. And this is the message he gave to Mary for you. Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. What he was saying to Mary was this, I am going to my Father and your Father, and you are part of my family. You belong. My father is your part, father, and you are part of the eternal family. Your home is in his heart. So, brothers, when your mission here is over and we enter in to glory, you will be like me when I came home from college. You'll be captivated by the many works, the many signs, the many, many things that you hardly noticed. Moments when the Father was whispering to you, revealing himself to you throughout your life. And that he's always been saying to you, you are home in my heart. And every grace and every moment of grace and that he's reached out to you, he, he was saying that, that, that this is your home. This is where you belong. And one day, we're going to see all those moments of grace. We're going to be seeing how the Father reached out to us and, and how we were veiled and couldn't see it because of whatever evil that surrounded us, but, but he was there. And so, would you stand? And let's just <clears throat> ask that this would be one of those moments of grace And I'm just going <clears> to 
What I want you to do is just to take a few moments within your heart just to talk to the Father. Just talk to him about what you just heard. If you don't know what to say, you can just say, Lord, show me the Father, and then I'll be satisfied. I'd like you to, uh, if you will, I mean, if you just want to stay where you're at in this space, you can just sit down. But if you, will, if you will, just turn to a brother and just share a little bit about what the Lord's saying to you or what you're saying to him. And then just have a brief prayer and then we will go into a break. But just let's spend about three or four minutes just, just responding with each other or by yourself. <clears throat> 